Well, there is this uh, husband that lived with a cat he absolutely hated. And one day he had just had it, and he decided, I'm going to get rid of this cat. And he puts the cat in his car, drives 10 miles out of town, throws the cat out the window, says, that's it. Drives home, pulls in the driveway, the cat is sitting on his front door. Now, what on earth? So he's frustrated by that, goes inside, thinks about it. He said, well, I'm going to take care of this cat tomorrow. So the next day, same thing. The guy gets the cat, throws him in the car, drives 20 miles outside of town, grabs the cat, throws him out the window, drives home, gets home, drives up the driveway. There's the cat sitting at the front door. This is crazy. Gets in a really bad mood, goes inside the house, thinks about it, stews over it. So I'm going to take care of this thing tomorrow. Next day comes, he says, I know exactly what I'm going to do. He gets the cat, puts him in the car, drives 40 miles outside of town. He goes down dirt roads, he goes over bridges, he goes on private property, driving through fields, around a forest, over a mountain. He gets so far away, throws the cat out the window, starts driving home, pulls over, calls his wife. Honey? Do you see the cat? Oh, yes, he's sitting on the front door, by the front door. Oh, could you please put him on the phone? I'm lost, and I need directions home. (laughs) Okay, well, (laughs) this week, we're going to close up our series about guaranteeing our marriages Till the day we die. <laughs> what we have to do in that. And I've really enjoyed the last four. This might be the most important uh, of the series. I don't know. I'll let God reveal that to you if it is. But this is a very important one. This one is never give up, right? How many of you are now married to somebody who is very, very different than you? Did anybody say yes, very, very different? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Because when we're dating, it's the opposites that really attract us to people. And we think, oh, it's just so fascinating. I love being with you. But you know what they say about opposites? At the beginning, opposites attract, but later on, opposites attack. <laughs> right? <laughs> so we kind of get there. Is there any, anybody here married to somebody who maybe they are very punctual and you are not very punctual? That there's a difference there and somebody's very tiny. Is anybody... Okay, you got something like that going on? Does anybody here have a a difference between them and their spouse? Maybe you and the other. But maybe your your kind of a thing is, I like to I like to plan things out. Don't, you know, throw me into anything. I I like to know what's going on. I like to have well planned vacations. But boy, you're married to somebody, they could care less. Spontaneity, that that's all the fun. Anybody relate to that? Okay, even more. What about uh, somebody one one is very uh, careful with their money. And boy, they just save their money, every little penny, and they want to make sure they're going to be okay. But then the other one just spends money like crazy. They they don't hold on. Anybody like that? Have a, is anybody a spender like uh, Ushers, could you please watch the, who the spenders are? That would be helpful in the future. Figure out who those good people are. We like spenders. <laughs> We, we, we have that, don't we? I don't know what it is. And, but these are the kinds of things that go on in a relationship. And I think when it starts off in the dating years, what it is, the, the way the person is so different, those are the things we adore about them because we're so focused on them. And we want to know more about them. And, and you don't know somebody who's like you. you. You want to know someone who's different than you. It's not boring, it's exciting. And that's how you go in. But at some point in that relationship, things take a little twist where you're not so interested in them, you're more interested in <laughs> you. <laughs> and, and the ways they're different really start to bug you because you want it to be your way and it's all about you. You know, you're the ones with the, with the best ideas. And anything different than you really gets under your skin. And what happens if we live with that constant conflict 
Either we learn how to manage that or it gets blown out of proportion and boy, it just takes us down one miserable road. And at some point, some people decide, you know, you're just too different than me. You know, there, there's even legal terms about that. You read about people getting divorced and, and they bring that up, you know, just, we just can't get along. It's just, and judge, well, okay, I understand that, sure, you know. And, and so now it's just like a precedent in our court system. Oh, they're different than you marry somebody different than you imagine that. Like anybody really ever marry somebody just like them? What are the chances that, you know, you're just like them and, and now you want to marry? That, that does, that's not the way it works. We all want to marry somebody different. And I think what happens is in the midst of all that, we lose track and sin sets into our heart where it's not about them anymore. Now it's back to us. That is the problem where, where that happened. That's the bottleneck. That's the bottleneck. It's not them. It's always us. We look back and say, what happened to me when my fascination? Well, I, I think in, in, in the midst of this, as, as we get going here, I just want to start off by saying, we're going to talk about being faithful and hanging in there with God. But the very important part I want to say is, the title to the series is, From This Day Forward. Because there's a lot of us that have screwed up our lives and screwed up relationships. And maybe, you know, you're, you're saying, you know, I really worked hard. I did everything I could to save the marriage, keep the thing going, but it wasn't enough. Or then maybe some are a little bit more honest and saying, you know what, I didn't do enough. I, I was too ignorant in those days. Now I see maybe a little bit better what I could have done. I don't want to talk about the past. I, don't, I want to leave the past in the past. I don't think it's of any value because today is not easy. Today is hard. And God wants to move us forward. So really, let's, let's embody that from this day forward in, in the practices. Now the five practices that we're talking about, number one is seek God. Number two is fight, fight fair. Number three is have fun. Number four is stay pure. And number five is never give up. Very good. Okay, let's try that again. Let's go back to the first slide and let's say it a little bit so we can remember these things because they're very, very important. Number one is seek God. God's number one, your spouse is number two, and with our two, we seek the one. Together, we seek God. Number two is fight fair. That's right. You want to get all the way to that belly button to belly button. Remember that? I know you remember that. <laughs> and number three is have fun. That's very important. That's right. Uh, and number, oh, that was the belly button to belly. I, I knew I wanted to get to the belly button part, <laughs> and I jumped it. All right, and then last Sunday, we talked about stay pure, and this Sunday, never give up. That's right, never give up. The first that we're going to look at here is Matthew chapter 19, and um, bring your attention to it, and this is what it says. Let's read this together. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. They asked is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his wife and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together... Let man not separate. Now, I read a word in there wrong, didn't I? It was a mistake. I think I said wife, and I should have said father, right? We'll leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Uh, I can't read. This is a situation that they put Jesus in. They want to figure out Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus in trouble. And the bigger picture is this, that the governor of that area that Jesus was in, this governor would go through wives like I go through candy. It's just, okay, I got this one, discard it, got this one, discard it. And he had kind of helped the law shape into a way that benefited him. And... Now, anybody who sh says anything in opposition to that, oh, now they frame that person and spin his position to be, oh, you're against the governor. Oh, you're, you're a, a, a rebel. Oh, you're trying to create a revolution. And, and so they can get somebody in trouble just trying to find. So they came to Jesus knowing full well, trying to get Jesus to say, no, you're not allowed to, to go through wives left and right. That is wrong. They're trying to get Jesus to say that. Jesus understands that. 
And what he does, he pulls all the way back, and he says, this is what God's vision is for a husband and wife, for a marriage. Men, they've come in, they've changed things around to meet their own needs. But in trying to meet their own needs, they have departed from what God's vision is for their relationship. And I want to ask you guys in your own lives, what is your vision for your marriage? It's a very important question. What is your vision for your, what do you want your marriage to be? And as you align up with what God's vision is, there are several words here that are are kind of important. We see here that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That doesn't mean they're not two different identities, but it means some kind of glue has happened in there. Some kind of a change has happened to unite them together. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, and then this is very important, what God has joined together. What God, imagine that. And a lot of us think that the reason we're married to somebody is because of the decisions we made. It might be in part, but also a bigger picture to it, and a much more accurate picture, is that this is how God led you. This is God bringing you into this marriage. This is a God thing. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. It's something that God... It's it's like if you got two pieces of paper, and you put a lot of glue on one of them, Elmer's glue, and then you put them the papers on top of each other and glued them together and you waited and then they dried and now you basically have one thick piece of paper and then if you were to try to separate those two what is it can you separate it no you can't separate it's going to rip and it's going to tear and you're just going to make a mess of everything and that's very similar to what we when god brings us together and we stand before god we say i do and we make our vows and then uh, we live the married life, what happens is we, we fuse with the other, and then for a human to come and try to tear that apart, it creates an ugly mess. It's just not meant to be torn apart. It's a lot of hurt, a lot of collateral damage, and, and I've met people who say, oh yeah, I, I need to get divorced so I can move on. I'm going to tell you, there's someone who's never been divorced. <laughs> you never move on after divorce. You carry all that baggage. That's why you start looking like the Samsonite salesman, because you got so much baggage everywhere you go. You're bringing all that with you. There's nothing pretty about it. It's a hard thing. It was never intended under God that the two should separate. But we live in this world where God's intention isn't always abided by and always paid attention. But in the life of a Christian, we are to pay attention to God's vision and God's purpose and what God has done. And this brings us to our second point here. And number this is that in marriage in the world, we kind of think of marriage as a contract. We kind of think as it is, okay, this is what I'm going to do and this is what you're going to do. And this is what crazy lawyers trying to make us think about marriage. And this is what crazy politicians try to make us think about marriage. It's a, it's a contract. It's a partnership. It's a business kind of a thing. But it's not. God says it's not a contract. It's a covenant. And what is a covenant? A covenant is a relationship. It's family. Now, I, uh, for instance, I was adopted, adopted as a child. And I never wondered, I never had any doubt that my parents would someday say, okay, Greg, we're done with you. <laughs> we spent enough money on you. You're a disappointment. You know, you're not in the MBA. I don't know, but be gone. Right? No, there is no such thing. I'm sorry, when they brought me home, that created a relationship. Now you got me. <laughs> Good and the bad and the ugly. And it's a lot of the last two. It's just the way it is. When God brings us together, it's a covenant, it's a relationship. There is no contract. A contract is about distrust. It's saying, I don't sure about you, but this is how I'm going to cover my, in my behind with you. That's a contract. With God, it's not about distrust. It's about commitment to a relationship, a family relationship that God has fused together. And that's very important for us to understand what God's vision is for what a marriage is. So let, let, let me move on from here a little bit. It, it pains me sometimes to hear people say, I am all out of love. I'm all out of love. Right? Journey? Okay, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but why? And, and then that adi- the attitude is, if I'm all out of love, I'm done with the relationship. 
That's not a Christian relationship. Why? Is, is it Christian because they never run out of... No, no, we run out of love very quickly. But running out of love and discarding the relationship is kind of like running out of gas and getting rid of your car. <laughs> you don't run out of gas and get rid of your car. You don't run out of love and then discard your marriage. Because the source of love was never in you to begin with. You never had enough love in you to carry you any distance in this marriage at all. Maybe enough to get you through engagement, dating, engagement, and a honeymoon, and maybe uh, you know one visit to the mother-in-law. But after that, boy, it's gone. You don't see anymore. It was never God's intention that you would use your unending source of love. It was God's intention that you would have a relationship with him first and that he would give you the love that you would show to your spouse. That's where the love comes from. It doesn't come from in here. It comes from above. My relationship with my spouse is not really about me and her or a wife and her husband. It's really about each one's relationship with God and then treating the other in a way that is right with God, in a way that God calls us to do. That's where it comes from. That's where the rules are. I don't respond to the behavior of my spouse. I respond to God's presence in me, regardless of the behavior. It's not easy being married. It's a lot easier if you're a Christian and a growing Christian. Because the what we need to have a great marriage is basically what all of us go through life with. We don't treat people the way they treat us in response to them. We treat them how God has treated us. He is the one who initiates our behavior and how we value and treasure other people. For the Christian, it's very different than the world. But for the Christian, that's the way it's always been. That's how Jesus teaches us. Which takes us to this point about sowing and reaping. I I like the uh, passage that uh, Pastor Marilyn brought up for the offerings. Very similar. It's just kind of a repetition of that. And here in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 9, let's read this together. Maybe I can read it right. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So this is back to this idea of you sowing and reaping. So two things about this. Number one, you reap what you sow. You harvest what you plant. If somebody were to uh, say something mean to you, what are you likely to say back to them? Well, basically, you can kind of expect them to say something mean back. If you were to smile at somebody, well, you can kind of expect them they're going to smile back at some point. If you were to give somebody the finger... What what kind of response do you think you're going to get from them? Well, you can kind of realize that. Now take that and grow that into a bigger picture, and it's the same thing with marriage. Well, I don't, you know, she doesn't treat me like this, or he doesn't do this for me. It's not about you reaping, it's about you sowing. Who cares what they give you? The important thing is, what are you giving them? If you don't like what you're getting back, the problem is with what you might be giving. It might be with what you are planting. And if you are somebody that says, well, I just keep planting this apple seed, and I just keep getting this duron fruit in return. I do everything right. They just give me everything wrong. I mean, you can go that all day long. But at some point, you've got to ask yourself, if all I'm getting back is the stinky fruit, if all I'm getting back is the sour, the bitter stuff, Am I sure I'm planting apple seeds? <laughs> Am I sure I'm planting strawberries, blueberries? Maybe I, you might want to look back at what you're planting and reevaluate this thing. Maybe, maybe you know you got wrong packaging on there or something. But you reap, you harvest what you plant, what you sow. Very important in our own lives to say, this is what I want and this is what I'm going to be doing. Get in there for the long run. Not everything grows overnight, but over a period of time, everything returns a harvest to it. And the second thing is, not only do you reap what you sow, you reap where you sow. Very important, because a lot of times, especially guys, we put our attention on anything and everything except our wife. 
And we go, hey, boy, I love, you know, my hobbies. Man, I love my job. I love my friends. I love my sports. I love all this kind of stuff. You know what you're doing? You're planting where you're going to sow. And so your hobbies, yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to get much better at it. You're going to increase your collection and all that kind of stuff. Your friends, they're, they're going to think you're the greatest thing. Your work is going to love you. They're going to, yeah, you, man, man, this guy's really dedicated. You're going to do all that. But you're also going to reap what all the benefit of that is. You've got to ask yourself, is that really going to carry me through life? Is this really the benefits that I want to have? Because none of those things stick around. None of those things care about you. None of those things are going to be there for you. To build a great marriage, you've got to invest in your marriage. You've got to invest where you're going to reap. Where So sow, plant into your marriage so you can reap from your marriage. Very important. Now this is something that I really like, and this is very true. For guys and women, of course, but also kind of a little bit more important for guys to understand is that women are a very fertile soil. Whatever you give a wife, she multiplies, whatever it might be. You, you give your wife a bachelor pad, and what does she turn it into? She actually turns it into a place that smells okay, a place that people come to, and, you know, they have a place to sit. Uh, if you want something to eat, there's actually a clean dish and things match and there's things on the walls. And all of a sudden, it turns into beauty. What she, did, she, she took something pitiful and made it something splendid, something wonderful. That's what women do. Bring home a bag of groceries. Boy, a, a, a good wife, they'll get that bag of groceries. They'll do this, they'll do that. Next thing you know, you got a series of really great meals coming out of there. It's a lot of women multiply things. You give a woman a lot of love and affection. What do you want? They're going to multiply that love and affection, and you're going to get, you know, the belly button, the belly button thing going again. That's what's what women do. You give women a, a lot of love and a lot of affection. What do they do? They multiply that and they give you a lot of babies. <laughs> That's just multiplying. That's just kind of what happens with women. They multiply things. But all the things I've mentioned are they multiply it for the good. But they also can multiply it for evil. <laughs> and if you don't give a woman something good, if you do give her a lot of trouble, oh Lord, <laughs> let me tell you what, you have unleashed hell into your life <laughs> and you're going to pay a lot, real steep price. <laughs> so I would really back off and say, make sure that I am investing, make sure I am planting the harvest that I want to enjoy later on. Think of it out ahead like that to see that. None of us are a victim of our spouse. None of us are. All of us are somebody who makes a decision day in and day out, sometimes even day by day, moment by moment. This is the kind of marriage I want to have. Decide today. Decide with your spouse. Decide by yourself. This is the kind of marriage I want to have. It really makes a difference. Say, hey, this is a vision that I have. This is how I want things to be. God has brought us together. What for? What is God's vision for this? What is God saying here? You decide what kind of a marriage you want to have. Make sure that gets in there and you play it out that way. Move in that direction. Do the things that result in that kind of, in that kind of a marriage. Let God do that. Sometimes we, we think that our spouse is like the enemy, that our spouse is trying to hurt us. Well, the Bible speaks to that too. What does the Bible say? Love your enemies and do good to those who would hurt you. Love your, pray, pray for your spouse if you see them as somebody who doesn't appreciate you or doesn't like, pray for them. Give it to God. Don't manipulate and don't try to say things to get your wife or your husband to react in certain ways. No, pray for them and let God do a work in their heart. That's the only way. Take it from the one who knows by experience. Let God do a work in their heart. Don't try to play games with them. Let them be who they want to be. But let God move in their hearts and in their lives. That's the best way to go through in a marriage at a difficult time. Let God do his work in them. Amen? That's very important. Now I just kind of want to close here real quick with this. Sometimes we get into a marriage and the idea is we've, we've just kind of run out of feeling like it. <laughs> I don't feel like working it on anymore. I don't feel like being married anymore. I don't feel like spending any more time with you. I don't feel like being nice to you anymore. I don't feel like... And man, that, those feelings can just wreak havoc on us and just keep going and going. Some of us here would say, yeah, yeah, that describes me pretty well. I don't feel like being married anymore. I don't feel like dealing with this. I don't feel like, feel like, feel like. But what I look at it is, you know what? Yeah, that might work in a small little world of marriage. But why don't you take it to the next step? 
Why don't you also say, I don't feel like going to work anymore. <laughs> I don't feel like paying my taxes. I don't feel like taking showers anymore, like, like our governor. I don't feel like this. I don't feel like, why don't you just keep going? Because at some point you're going to say, you know what? <laughs> How I feel is, is not really leading to a very good life for me. So dial it all the way back. Don't stop at the marriage. Dial it beyond before the marriage. Say, you know what? It's not about how I feel. It really is about doing the right thing. Because I'll tell you something that is very, very true. And the Bible teaches this from beginning to end. Your feelings will follow your actions. It's never the other way around. You do not act on your feelings. Your feelings act on your actions. Let your actions go forward. Even though you don't feel like it, say, but how is it that God would have me be with this person? How would God have me relate to this person? And implement that. And then you magically find yourself, you know what, they're not so bad. Okay, I can tolerate them a little bit longer. Okay, we're going to be okay. Next thing you know, man, back you are in the engaged days and the honeymoon days. Let your feelings, don't let your feelings control your life. Step back, let your actions control your life, and say, you know what, we're going to... We're not going to be ruled by our feelings. We're going to be ruled by the rule of God in our lives. And we're going to do what's right. I've met people that have said, I'm done with this marriage. And I'm just going to suffer through it. Suffer through it. We'll stay together as long as we have to. And they'll, sometimes they'll put some rules on that. This is just the way it's going to be. And they just suffer through it. Why? Why? You don't get a second chance at this life. This is it. Why would you choose to be miserable? Why would you choose to do things to just make... Isn't life hard enough already? Aren't people cruel enough? Isn't isn't struggle enough already? Why do you have to create a struggle where you're at? Why not set aside and say, you know what? No, I'm not happy. It's not easy. But these are the five things I'm going to start doing to change my own heart. And we're going to see this marriage through this hard time and to the point where it starts to align with what God's vision and what God's purpose is for this marriage. Don't, don't be in a marriage that's awful. Get out and move into where God is blessing you. God does what God wants to do. You know, sometimes we, we can go back to this passage in this last verse. And I love this thing. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. That is so true. That is true in marriage. It's true in every area. But let us not become weary. Some of us are weary. Some here are exhausted from their marriage. Let us not become weary in doing good. But you are doing good. And remember, you're going to reap what you sow. If you're sowing good seed, if you're sowing positive, helpful things, caring things, if you're sowing the love of God into their life and not what you need but what God desires, trying to negotiate and encourage and help and coach along to to fulfill God's vision, if you're doing those kinds of things, if you do not grow weary, if you stay doing that good, what's going to happen? You're going to reap a harvest. You're going to reap a harvest. Stay faithful through that reaping of the harvest to see what God... Well, what does it mean I'm going to reap a harvest in my marriage? What what does that actually look like? I think each one of us would define it maybe just a little bit different, but basically it would all be the same. For me, how would I define it? I I would want to leave a legacy. I would want to leave a legacy with, with with you guys in the church that you'd say, wow... Look at Pastor Greg's marriage, Don. What, what an example. What, what strength. What, how helpful. How inspiring for our own marriage. I'd want my own boys to look at the marriage and say, wow, that's, that's the kind of marriage I want to have. When you live right before God, you do leave a legacy that people will look back and be inspired by and be grateful for. For the marriage that you've a lot of you have helped other couples, have helped other people by modeling the life that is, is to lifting our marriage up for God's standard of vision for your marriage. You've been a blessing that way. You know, when we seek God together, when we fight fair, when we uh, pull things together and have a good time and include other people in that, when we stay pure before God, hold that high standard of of not even a hint of immorality or impurity in our lives. And and when we come together uh, to, to just keep going, to never give up, when we do that, we affect other people. And that covenant just begins to emerge that covenant we, we begin to reap what we've been sowing thank god it's, it's a wonderful thing and it's a relationship not a contract a relationship and what are we going to find when we get to heaven it's god's plan all along it's not about a contract it's about a relationship us with god and god's relationship with us and our relationship with others 
That's what God brings us together. This is God's intention. This is God's plans for our lives. I really encourage all of us in our marriages and those who are yet to be married and those who might be looking at remarriage, whatever it might be. Boy, look at what God's vision is and reach for God's standard of his vision and God's goal. I know there's a lot of junks being told to us by other people about what marriage should be. Don't listen to them. Go right to God. Listen to God and incorporate that and let that set the action, the behavior of your life for your marriage. And I'll tell you what. Not a moment of regret. You won't have a moment of regret. In fact, much the opposite. You'll be thanking God to the day, that last day that it talks about that you're on earth. Thank you, God, for giving me somebody in my life that's been there for me, that's been the missing piece in my life. Thank you, Lord, for completing my life with your presence and bringing me into this relationship. Thank you, Lord, for all the gifts that you've given. Let our lives be like that. Amen? Let us pray.